we now have a rock solid Travis CI deployment process, or maybe pre-deployment, I guess would be the best way of saying it. It's our build pipeline of sorts. Anytime that we make a change to our GitHub repository, Travis is going to automatically pull down our repo and build out a new set of production images and then push them off to Docker Hub. So now we need to start thinking about how we're going to use these images and actually deploy them in production. So for that, we're going to again be using Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. Now, as a quick reminder, back when we had a single Docker container in our last project, something was kind of going on automatically behind the scenes anytime that we pushed our code over to Elastic Beanstalk. You might have noticed that you and I did not have to set up any custom configuration or anything to tell Elastic Beanstalk that, hey, you need to take this Docker file and build it and run the image that comes out of that. That was an automated process. We didn't have to add any configuration. We essentially just took our project directory with a Docker file in the root directory, threw it over to Elastic Beanstalk, and Elastic Beanstalk said, well, you know what? They got a Docker file. I guess I might as well build it and try running the image that comes out of that. So now this time around, we're in a very different situation. We don't have a single Docker file anymore. We have a couple of different folders and each of them has a separate Docker file. And so if we just toss this entire project directory off to Elastic Beanstalk, it would probably say, hey, look, I know you got these Docker files. I don't know which one you want me to run. So anytime that we want to run multiple separate containers on Elastic Beanstalk at the same time, we have to go through an extra little step of configuration to tell Elastic Beanstalk exactly how to treat our project. So here's what we're gonna do. Inside of our project directory, we're going to create a file with a very special name. This file is called dockerrun.aws.json. This is going to be a JSON file, so it's gonna contain some JSON data that's going to tell Elastic Beanstalk exactly where to pull all of our images from, what resources to allocate to each one, how to set up some port mappings, and some associated information. In fact, when you think about the purpose of this Docker Run AWS JSON file, it's going to very quickly remind you of exactly how our Docker Compose.yaml file is set up. Remember, Docker Compose is primarily meant for use in development environments, and you can kind of think of it as a single file that encodes a lot of directions that would normally be passed directly to Docker Run. Inside of our current Docker Compose file, we list out a bunch of different services. And then with each service, we tell Docker how to build the image, what ports to open, environment variables, and a bunch of stuff like that. So we're gonna do a very similar thing with this Docker Run AWS JSON file. The only difference is that rather than referring to these as services, like they're called over on Docker Compose, the Docker Run file refers to them as container definitions. The biggest difference that you're going to see between these two files is that in the Docker Compose file, it's going to contain some information about how to build an image using a Docker file, right? That's what we were doing inside of Docker Compose. If you go open up the Docker Compose file right now, you'll see that in each service, we have the different build directions. But in the case of the AWS JSON file, we already have a set of images. So rather than saying, oh, here's how to build the client or here's how to build Nginx, we're just gonna say, go and pull the image from Docker Hub with the name of your Docker ID slash multi dash client. We just say, go pull this image. Elastic Beanstalk is going to automatically pull down that image and use it for each of these different container definitions that we're going to add. So again, I really want you to think of these two files as being rather similar. The Docker run file is really just customized to work directly with AWS. And the big difference between the two is that the Docker compose file has directions on how to build an image. But with the Docker run file, we have already built the image, no build required. We're just going to specify the image to use. So let's take a quick pause right here. In the next section, we're gonna start putting together our container definition file, the dockerrun.aws.json file. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we make a dockerrun.aws.json file to tell Elastic Beanstalk how to work with our multiple containers. Now, before we start working on this file, I wanna show you a little piece of documentation that's going to be very valuable when you start making use of Elastic Beanstalk on your own projects. First, a little bit of behind the scenes action. So Elastic Beanstalk doesn't actually know how to work with containers, especially a multi-container environment. 
Behind the scenes, when you tell Elastic Beanstalk to host a set of containers, it's actually delegating that hosting off to another service that is provided in Amazon called the Elastic Container Service, which is abbreviated very frequently as ECS. You work with Amazon ECS by creating files that are called task definitions. And a task definition is essentially a file that tells ECS how to run one single container. Each of these task definition files are very similar, almost identical to the container definitions that you and I are going to write inside of our Docker run AWS.json file. And so the piece of documentation that I want to show you is the documentation around these task definitions. Essentially, it's a really confusing thing to understand here or to figure out, I should say. But if you look at the documentation for the Docker run file, it's not going to tell you a lot about the different options that you can pass to these container definitions because it actually kind of wants you to go and look at the documentation for a task definition as defined by Amazon ECS. So that's why I'm showing this documentation because it's not immediately clear when you start reading this stuff that you need to go and read about this completely different service that AWS is running if you want to figure out how to customize your Docker run file. So long story short, let's pop open a new tab. We're going to pull up the documentation for a task definition, which is essentially what you and I are writing inside of that Docker run file. So I'm going to do a search for Amazon ECS task definition. And then one of the first results you'll see here is at docs.aws.amazon.com. We're looking for Amazon ECS task definitions. So hopefully you'll see a page that looks something like this right here. If you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a topic of task definition parameters. You'll come to this page, and then on the right-hand side, you're going to look for container definitions. And so what you and I are going to write inside of our docker run.aws.json file is essentially going to follow the format that you see right here. So this is the documentation that you can refer to if you want to get a better understanding of what we are writing inside that file. So we're going to add in properties like name, image, memory, all this other stuff to that file. Okay, so now that you know where to look, if you want to get some documentation around this stuff, let's take a quick pause right here, and then we'll get started on that file in the next section. In the last section, we took a look at some of the documentation that was going to be used to write our docker run.aws.json file. So without further ado, let's get to it. I'm going to flip over to my code editor, and then inside of my root project directory, I'll make a new file called docker run.aws.json. Now I'm going to blow up the size of my editor here just so you can see the name very easily. Notice how it is the word docker and then the word run. So there's two R's in there. Now the file type we're going to be working with here is a JSON file. So we have to enter JSON file throughout this entire thing. So to get started, we're going to put down one wrapping object with a set of curly braces like so. And then we're going to tell Elastic Beanstalk what syntax we are using inside this file. So we're going to place AWS EB Docker run version is two. So as you might imagine, there was a version one of this file or the syntax used within this file. We're using version two, which is going to have this file be interpreted in a very specific way. We'll then put a comma on the very end, and then we'll start to list out all the different container definitions. Now, container definitions is very purposefully done as a plural. So definitions, we have many definitions. So we're going to put an array in here, and then we're going to list out a number of different container definitions. For every entry that you and I put into this array right here, we're going to have one distinctly separate container created inside of our application. So at the end of the day, you and I have four custom images that we want to be hosted by Elastic Beanstalk. So we're going to add four separate entries inside of this container definitions array. For the first one we put together, let's write out the configuration block for our client to get started. So I'm going to put a new object inside of here with a set of curly braces. And then I will provide a name for this container. The name does not have to be identical to the project name or the folder or anything like that. This is the name of your container that's going to eventually show up on a dashboard so that you can identify it. 
Now, just to stay consistent in all things, we are going to use the same name of our sub project. So we're going to give it a name of client. Next up, we're going to list out the image to use for this container. So again, remember every record inside of container definitions, so like this record right here, corresponds to an actual container that is going to be created along with our deployment. So right here, we're going to specify the exact image that will be used to represent this container. So the image we're going to use is going to be the multi-client image that we just pushed to Docker Hub. So multi-client, this one right here. Now to specify that image, this is what I was talking about nonstop in the last couple of sections when I was saying, oh yeah, Docker Hub is great because it's like the central repo for all these different deployment services. So in order to specify that image on Docker Hub, all you have to do is write out your Docker ID and then the name of that image. So for me, it's multi-client, chances are that for you is the same. So when AWS sees this string right here, it's gonna say, oh, they must be talking about Docker Hub. And so they're going to go off to Docker Hub. They're going to look up your Docker ID and then see if you have a repo in there or a image with the name of multi-client. And if you do, it'll then pull down that image and use it as the basis for this container right here. So like I said, really easy to use Docker Hub with a lot of these different hosting services. Now the next thing we're going to do is set up a host name. Now the host name is a little bit more complicated. Let's fill out the entry here and I'll tell you a little bit more about what it's for. So we're gonna say that it's going to be a client. Okay, so quick reminder here. Remember that back inside of our Docker Compose file, I'm gonna open up it up here really quickly. Inside this file, we had the list of services and every service had a different name. So for example, our client was called client. By setting up this name right here, it essentially created a new host name that could be ac accessed by any other container that was created by Docker Compose. And so the end result of that was, for example, inside of our Nginx folder, if you look at that default.con file, remember that inside of here, we were able to reference another container simply by writing out like, oh yeah, HTTP client. So client right here, you know, you would normally write something like google.com but we were able to just write out client and that was resolved as that other container inside of our grouping of containers. And so with the Docker compose file, we kind of set up that host name by just defining the name of the service right here. But in the world of the Docker run aws.json file, we have to specify a very distinct host name. And so when we say host name right here, we're essentially giving every other container in this group of containers the ability to access this container right here by trying to make a request with a host name of client. So if you really wanted to mess things up, you could do something like google.com. And then if you ever tried to make a request to google.com from one of your containers, rather than going to the real google.com, it would go to this container right here. And obviously that's not what we want. So we're going to give it a host name of client instead. Okay, let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue working on the Docker run file in just a moment. In the last section, we started putting together our container definitions inside of the docker run.aws.json file. We're now going to continue with two other important parameters that are going to be added to our client container right here. So the next one that we're going to put on is a flag called essential. And we're going to set it to false by default. The essential flag is something that we've not seen before in any other Docker concept. The essential flag essentially means that this container right here is not considered to be, as you might guess, essential. So what would it mean if we marked this thing as essential true? If we marked a container as essential true and this container ever crashes for any reason whatsoever, then all the other containers in this group of containers will be closed down at the same time. So in other words, if we end up with some other containers inside of here, like let's say container one, and notice this is not valid syntax. I just mean to say that there are some other containers in here. Now, if client was marked as essential and this thing crashed for any reason, container one and container two would be automatically shut down as well, even if they are still running A-OK. -okay. Now, in the case of our client, if this thing crashes for any reason, that's kind of OK. And I would still want all the other containers or the other services in my group of containers to continue running. The only service that I have or we have inside this list of container definitions that you and I really care about is the Nginx routing server. 
Remember, that's the server that routes to either the client or the API, the Express API that we have. So if that thing goes down, it means that no one can access any of the different services in our group of containers. And so we're probably going to want to mark that one as our essential container to say, hey, if the Nginx server crashes, well, we can't reach any of the other services in our grouping of containers, so we better just shut everything down. Now, the one little bit of trivia that I want to share with you about essential right here is that at least one service in your listing of container definitions must be marked as essential. So at least one thing inside of here has to be essential. And like I just said, we're going to treat the Nginx container as our essential service. So I'm going to flip the client back over to false to say that, hey, if this thing crashes, that's kind of okay. We don't really care. Now, the last property that we're going to add on here. Oh, actually, you know what? I Excuse me. That was the last one. Okay, so that's it for our client definition. We're now going to skip over Nginx and take care of the server and the worker container definitions as well. Those are both going to end up being very similar to the client definition that we just put together. The Nginx one is going to be a little bit different. That's why we're going to save it for last. So after the client definition, I'll put in a comma and then open up another record. Remember, every one of these objects right here represents a different container that we want to create. So the next one is going to have a name and we'll do the server. So I'll call this server. The image that we're going to use is multi-server. So we'll say your Docker ID slash multi dash server. And then the host name this time around, remember that when we put together our host name inside of the nginx default.com file right here, if you open that file up, you'll recall that we actually renamed that endpoint or that host name to be API because we have been calling that express project server, but we very quickly realized that, you know, if we called everything server, stuff was going to get really confusing really quickly. And it just didn't make a lot of sense. And so we ended up renaming this host as API instead. So for the host name over here, rather than making use of server, we're going to use API because that is what the Nginx server is going to look for when it tries to redirect traffic upstream. And then finally, we'll add on an essential to this one. And this will also be false because, yeah, it's not the best thing if our server crashes for any given reason. But if it does crash, well, there's not a good reason to shut down everything else as well. OK. So now on to the next one, we'll move on to our worker container. So I'll do a name of worker. We'll do an image of your Docker ID slash multi dash worker. Our host name is going to be worker and essential as you might guess. Yep. This one's also false. So out of all the services that we have, without a doubt, the worker crashing is the least of our concerns. If the worker crashes, our application can still be visited by users. Users can still enter an indices to be calculated, and they can still see values that have already been calculated by the worker in the past. So if the worker crashes, that just means that we're not going to calculate any values in the future. And I'm totally OK with that. If that happens, no big deal. We could definitely do a little bit of debugging, figure out why the worker crashed, and then figure out some way to start it back up in the future. OK, so that's it for container definitions for the client, server, and worker. Now we have to do the Nginx one last here. So let's take another quick pause. We'll come back in the next section, and we'll take care of that container definition. So I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to take care of our very last container definition, the definition for our Nginx container. And remember, this is the container that's going to do some routing of incoming requests to either the client or the backend API server. So inside my docker run aws.json file, I'll add a comma, put in our last configuration object. So we're going to give this a name of nginx. For our image, we'll make use of your docker ID slash multi dash nginx like so. Now this time around, we're not going to add in a host name because no other service in everything that we have here needs to directly access nginx. The host name is actually an optional field. And because nothing needs to kind of reach out to Nginx and get a handle on it, we are not required to add in a host name. Now, you definitely can if you want to. So if you want to be 100% complete, we could add in a host name of Nginx or whatever you might want to do. But it's not strictly required in this case. 
you know, now that I think about it, the worker hostname here is actually not required as well because nothing is actually reaching out to the worker as well. So you could probably get away with deleting that if you want to be a little bit adventurous, but I'm going to leave it in. Okay, so now we're going to add in our essential flag to the Nginx definition, and we're going to add in two additional flags on top of that as well. So we'll say essential is true. So like I said previously, at least one container must be marked as essential. If this container crashes for any reason, everything else, all these other containers, will be automatically shut down at the same time. And that definitely makes a lot of sense with our current architecture. Because like we said just a moment ago, if the Nginx server crashes, well, that's pretty much it. Users cannot access the API, they can't access the client, and the worker can technically still run, but essentially this group of containers is now kind of dead, and we should shut everything down and try to fix it up at some point in the future. So that's why we are going to mark Nginx as essential true. Okay, now we're going to put in two other flags that we did not add into any of the previous ones. Very quickly, I want to open up the docker-compose.yaml file. You'll recall that to expose traffic to our group of containers, we had opened up a port for the Nginx service right here. And so we had said that if you ever try to visit our group of containers at localhost 3050, that would map up to port 80 inside the container, because Nginx by default is going to listen on port 80. And so we need to do that exact same port mapping process inside of our Nginx server configuration right here as well. So we're going to do a port mapping by saying port mappings. This is going to be an array because we could technically have several different port mappings. I'm going to put in a single record inside of here that will have a host port of 80 and a container port of 80 as well. So this means open up a port on the host or on the machine that is hosting all of our containers and map that to port 80 inside of the container, which again is the default port that Nginx listens to inside the container. So as you can see, setting up a port mapping is a little bit more typing than it was back inside of the Docker Compose file. Back inside of Docker Compose, we got away with just saying ports is, oh yeah, 3050 colon 80. In the Docker run file, a lot more syntax goes into it, but at the end of the day, it does the exact same thing. It maps a port inside the container to a port on the host or the machine that is running all these containers. Now, one last flag that we're going to add on to the Nginx configuration. So after the closing square bracket for the port mappings, I'll make sure I get a comma in there. And then I'm going to add on links. We'll talk about what links is in just a second, but first let's fill out the definition for it. This is going to be an array, and it's going to have a string that refers to our server and our client. So here's the links array. We'll say client and server like so in two separate strings separated by a comma. So let's talk about what this is doing. As a quick reminder, back inside of our Docker Compose file, we were very easily able to kind of communicate between different containers by making use of the different host names. So for example, when the API had to connect to Redis, we simply said, oh yeah, connect to the host name of simply Redis. Anytime that the API made a request out to a host name of Redis, it automatically got routed over to this other running service or this other running container. When you start deploying containers over to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, however, or you know, as we've said, behind the scenes, technically ECS, we have to do a little bit more explicit mapping or kind of more explicitly form up links or connections between these different containers. So in the world of Docker Compose, everything was easy as pie. We just said, oh yeah, try to access this other running service over here, or try to access this other running service over here and Docker Compose kind of took care of everything for us or all that networking for us. So in the world of ECS, you and I have to form a little bit more distinct links before between each of these running containers. So in our case, we know that Nginx needs to eventually send some traffic or redirect a request from the Nginx server to either the client or the API. So in our case, we want to make sure that Nginx knows that these other two containers exist, and we're going to do so by forming up a link between them. Now notice that links are kind of unidirectional. In other words, Nginx right here only has to kind of point over to client, but we don't have to form a opposite direction connection like so. It's just unidirectional. We just say, oh yeah, form a connection from Nginx over to the client. 
And so in our case right here, we're saying, yep, form a link from Nginx over to the client container and the server container. And one thing I want to mention here is that the name to links that we're providing maps up to the name property of the other container definition. So for example, this gets really important with the server definition right here because we used a name of server, but we used a host name of API. So for host name, we did not, or excuse me, for the link definition, we did not say API right here. Instead, we just provided the name to that other container. That's how we form out the link. All right, so that's pretty much it for our container definition file. Now, the last thing that I kind of recommend you do, just because this is a JSON file and it's really easy to make typos in here without realizing it, one thing that you might do is open up a new tab and do a search for like JSON validator or something like that, and then find any random service in here, and then take all the JSON that we just put together, copy it, and throw it into the validator. And then somewhere on here, oh, there we go, validate JSON. And that's gonna say, okay, you have valid JSON. So if you made any typo, this will very quickly tell you and give you a little bit of feedback before you try deploying the application because uh, Elastic Beanstalk is gonna be a little bit brutal when it comes to validating the JSON here. It's gonna be a lot more challenging to figure out exactly where the typo was. So again, I do recommend that you do just a quick validation to make sure that you don't have any missed commas or missed curly braces or, didn't use uh, single quotes instead of double quotes or whatever it might be. All right, so that's pretty much it for our Docker run aws.json file. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and start setting up our environment on Elastic Beanstalk in the next section. In the last section, we finished up our Docker run file. Now the last thing that we really have to do here, well, almost the last thing, is create a new environment over on Elastic Beanstalk. And that's gonna serve as the target that we deploy our application to, eventually from the travis.yaml file. So to get started, I'm gonna open up my browser and I'll navigate to aws.amazon.com. And then I'm going to, again, log into my account And then just as before, I can either find the services drop down up here or just type it into the services listing right here, or chances are you might see it listed as a recently listed service. Let me zoom in so you can see this a little bit better as well. So we'll search for Beanstalk and we are looking for Elastic Beanstalk. Now you'll notice that when I come here, I see the default dashboard again. That's because I deleted the other project that we had previously created. So as a quick reminder, remember anything that you create in this course, you can potentially be billed for if you are no longer on AWS's free plan. If you only created your AWS account in the last year or so, then you're still on the free plan. But if you made your account more than one year ago, then you're off the free plan and you're going to be paying for these resources. So you will definitely want to make sure that you delete any different instances or anything like that that we create through this course. So just like we did previously on the top right hand side, I'm going to find the create new application button. And for this application, I'll give it a name of multi docker and then I'll create the project. Just as before, we have to create an environment that matches up to the application that we just created. So I'll click on create one now. We're again going to make a web server environment. We then get prompted with a little bit of a form right here. We don't really care about anything in the first section, so I'll scroll on down to the base configuration. And for pre-configured platform, we're going to choose multi-container Docker right there. And then we can leave it selected as sample application. And then finally, on the bottom right-hand side, we'll say create environment. And that's gonna start going through a whole bunch of scrolling information right here. That's definitely gonna take a little bit of time. All right, now before we move on, there's one thing that you might have noticed that we've kind of totally missed in all of our discussion about deployment over to Elastic Beanstalk. We missed this in putting together the Travis.yml file. It's something that we have not discussed one bit. If you open up your Docker Compose file, the two very top services that we created inside of here was the Postgres database and the Redis in-memory data store as well. But we have not done a single darn thing with the Travis.yml file or the Docker run aws.json file to say that we need a instance of Postgres or a container running Postgres or Redis at any point in time. So it kind of seems like we completely dropped the ball on that, like we just totally missed it. 
Well, this actually kind of leads into a larger discussion that I want to have about running databases inside of containers. So let's take a quick pause right here while our environment is being created. We'll come back to the next section and we'll talk about how you and I are going to approach creating a container with Postgres and Redis for use inside of our application. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we created a new Elastic Beanstalk environment for our multi-container Docker application. It looks like my application has successfully been created, but before we start working with this thing at all, I want to have a quick discussion on something that it seems like we kind of left out in all of our Docker run file stuff and all of our Travis stuff so far as well. So inside of our Docker run file, like I said at the end of the last section, we appear to have no references to any containers that are running Postgres or Redis, as we had previously set up inside of the Docker compose file. So let's talk about why that is. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple diagrams. I want to first remind you about the overall architecture of our development environment. We had said, yeah, we got the Nginx, the Express, Worker, all that stuff. And then most notably, we had the Redis container and the Postgres container as well. So in the development environment, we were running these two data services inside of containers. But as we move over to a production environment, we're going to change up this architecture in a pretty significant way. Now, I, we're going to make this architecture change for a very good reason. So let me show you first a diagram that's going to tell you a little bit about the architecture, and then I'll tell you many reasons about why we're going to take this alternate approach in production. OK, so first off, the diagram. Here's what our architecture is going to be in the production environment. So we're still going to have the Nginx routing server, the Nginx file server, the Express API, and the worker. And those are all going to be running inside of our Elastic Beanstalk instance. We've already wired up the definition for all four of these containers inside of that Docker run aws.json file. The instance of Redis and the instance of Postgres that are going to be serving data for our application, however, will not be inside of the Elastic Beanstalk instance. Instead, we are going to rely upon two external services for, to fulfill all of our data needs for our application. The two services that we're going to use are called AWS, Relational Database Service, very frequently abbreviated as simply RDS, and Amazon Elastic Cache. These are two services that are kind of general in nature. And when I say general in nature, I mean that they're not customized specifically for using with Elastic Beanstalk. They're not customized to be specifically used with containers. They can be used with just about any type of application out there you can think of, whether or not it uses Elastic Beanstalk or whether or not it uses containers. So they are general data services that can be used with just about any application. All right, so let's talk about why we're going to be using these services to host our copy of Redis and our copy of Postgres. So there's a couple of very good reasons that we might choose to use these outside services rather than creating our own containers manually and using our own containers for housing Redis or our Postgres instances. So in the case of Elastic Cache, we've got a couple of very good reasons to use this service as opposed to making our own copy of Redis and hosting it inside of that instance. So first off, Elastic Cache is going to automatically create an instance of Redis for you. This is a absolute professional grade Redis. So it's got all the settings, all the configuration that you would ever expect to have in a production deployment of Redis. And the common theme here is going to be that there are many settings set up by default for you that are probably going to be very beneficial for your application that you might not even know exist. In other words, you and I might not be Redis experts. We not, might not really know how to use Redis properly in a production environment. But Amazon has a lot of engineers, like entire teams of engineers, who are absolute like doctorates. Like They have their PhD essentially on Redis, and they know exactly how to set this thing up for a production deployment or a production environment. And that's kind of the running theme around why we would choose to use these external services for managing all of our data. These teams at AWS, they know how to set this stuff up and they know how to manage it extremely well. Now above that, with Elastic Cache, it's extremely easy to scale. So as you might imagine, if our application one day got really, really popular and we saw that for whatever reason, our Redis instance was crashing all the time because our container or the hardware allocated to our container was insufficient, well, that might be a little bit of a pain for you and I to scale. We would have to figure out some way to allocate more resources to the container. We would have to figure out some way to restart the container without losing any data. Definitely a little bit of a headache there. 
But with Elastic Cache, we can essentially just say, hey, uh, you know, I think we need some more hardware here. I think that we need to upgrade the amount of memory or the processor or whatever it might be. And Elastic Cache is going to automatically manage that upgrade path for you. And you don't have to worry about doing a bunch of manual configuration or stuff like that. We get built-in log logging, built-in maintenance. If there are security patches around Redis, AWS is going to automatically apply them for you. You're going to get automatic logs generated. You don't have to worry about getting logs out of your container and somehow reporting them to outside some outside service. In addition, very close related to the first item up here that we spoke about, yeah, you know, we we're definitely concerned about security inside of our application, and we've done a couple of things to upgrade the security of our containers. However, with Elastic Cache, chances are they probably have a better idea around security than we do. And so I kind of feel a little bit more com comfortable kind of delegating all these responsibilities off to AWS rather than trying to manage security on my own for this particular service. Now, this last one right here, this is one of the real big ticket items. This is one of the big reasons that you might choose to use one of these outside data services. We have a application architecture set up right now that is completely reliant upon Elastic Beanstalk and totally reliant upon making use of containers. I don't know what our application lifecycle is going to be. In other words, I don't know how long my application might need to be deployed and maintained. It's entirely feasible that at some point in time in the future, we might decide to migrate off Elastic Beanstalk and go off to some other service. And when we do that migration, it's going to be a lot easier to migrate away if we are making use of Elastic Cache because it's completely decoupled from Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Cache doesn't care where you're making a connection to it from. It could be from Elastic Beanstalk, it could be from some Kubernetes cluster, it could be some from some random EC2 instance. All Elastic Cache cares about is that you are making a connection to it. And so it'll be much easier to make changes to our application in the future or entirely change the architecture if we're making use of this outside service. Now, essentially all the same points apply to the relational database service as well. Everything totally related as well. Yeah, they got these teams who know really, really, really well how to set up Postgres for production deployments. They make it really easy to scale, log, security. Now, the real big ticket item here, however, is this point right here. So something that does not get very frequently covered in a lot of courses, even courses that I make, is making backups of your database. In other words, making a backup of all the records in your database in case anything goes wrong at some point in the future. Setting up automated backups is not the easiest thing in the world. And in many cases, if you want to get some easy service to do it for you, you actually have to pay a little bit extra for that. And I'm talking about if you're using like a third-party add-on that's going to attach to your container and make automated backups or whatever might need to happen. AWS RDS, or Relational Database Services, has automated systems for taking backups for you. And if you ever decide, oh no, we've got some data corruption, or we did something really, really wrong inside of our application in the production environment, it's like one or two button clicks to roll back your database to one of those backups. And so with AWS RDS, it makes life just incredibly easy when you start thinking about maintenance of data and data security. So that's kind of my spiel. It might sound like I'm a you know, huge fanboy of AWS or something like that. In reality, no, I'm not a huge fan of AWS one bit, to be totally honest with you. I think that many aspects of it are rather challenging to work with. I'm not the biggest fan. However, I still do recommend making use of these outside services. Anytime that you're working with, say, Postgres or Redis or Memcache or any type of outside data service, I do recommend that you try making use of these services wherever possible because they're going to do a lot of stuff for you that is, by default, kind of challenging to do on your own. Now, one last thing I want to say here, yes, these services do cost a little bit of extra money, but to be honest, if you're making a serious application, we're talking about like dollars per month for running a Postgres instance and dollars per month of running a Redis instance. As a software engineer, your time is worth money and it might take you an entire day or an entire week to set up and maintain Postgres and Redis in a very appropriate fashion inside of Elastic Beanstalk. And so that one day or that one week, well, that, you know, that time that you're spending, that is money. You know, your time is worth money. And so at the end of the day, it kind of is worth justifying to say, yeah, we're going to spend like 10 bucks or 20 bucks per month on a Postgres instance hosted through RDS rather than trying to maintain it on our own. All right. Now, very last thing I want to say here. So having said all that, you know, 
yeah, I'm kind of advocating making use of these automated services. But having said all that, this is a course about getting a application running using containers. So our next project is going to set up Redis and Postgres in a production environment from scratch. We're not going to make use of any external service. So although I do recommend that you use the ex external services, I still want you to understand how we can set up an application that doesn't use them at all if you want to essentially strike it out on your own. Or if you're ever hosting on an environment that doesn't provide these kind of managed solutions. For example, let, like let's say DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean doesn't have automatically managed copies of Redis or Postgres available, and you would have to manage those instances yourself. So we are going to go through an example of how you would set all this stuff up on your own in a production environment as well. But at the same time, in this example, I want to, sh to show you, you know, I just want to show you both ways. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Okay, so enough of me rambling on about this. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to start setting up a instance of Elastic Cache, instance with relational database services, and then learn how to wire them up over to Elastic Beanstalk. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about reasons that you might decide to use an outside Elastic Cache or RDS instance for data needs in your application. In this section, we're going to talk about how we set up these outside services and connect them to Elastic Beanstalk. So unfortunately, you have to do a little bit of behind the scenes work here. Fortunately, the amount of work we have to do is very, very small. Like it's just going to be a handful of clicks, but the very few clicks or the very few actions that we're going to take require some kind of specialized knowledge. And so before we go and create the RDS instance or the EC instance, I want to very quickly give you an overview of exactly what we're going to do. All right, so you and I are going to have an Elastic Beanstalk instance, and inside of it are going to be our four different containers. And we're going to eventually want to connect those containers, or at least some number of them, to RDS, the Postgres instance we create, and Elastic Cache, or the Redis instance that we create. Now, unfortunately, in the world of AWS, by default, these services do not get to talk to each other. In other words, once we create these other services, we cannot just automatically say, oh, hey, containers, go out and find this RDS instance for me and connect to it and make use of Postgres or whatever you might want to do. Instead, we have to form up a very distinct link between the two. And that's the kind of series of clicks that we have to go through. Now, when I use the word link, I am not talking about the same kind of link that we put together inside of the Docker run file just a little bit ago. So the kind of connection between Elastic Beanstalk and RDS and EC that we're going to form up here has absolutely nothing to do with Docker. Docker is not involved one bit whatsoever. This is a completely unrelated aspect of wiring up these different services together, completely unconnected from Docker. All right, so here's the background. Here's what you need to know. Right now, when we created our Elastic Beanstalk instance over here called MultiDocker, it was created in a very specific region of the world. So Amazon has a variety of different regions or essentially data centers where you can create these different services. Right now, I'm using the Northern California region. You can find what region you're using on the top right hand side. And you can actually also just take a quick glance at the URL to get the actual kind of like region code of where you are. So for me, I'm at US-West-1. That's the kind of technical designation of US West or Northern California. Now in each of these different regions, by default, you get something created a, that is called a virtual private cloud or VPC for short. A VPC essentially is kind of its own private little network so that any instance or any different service that you create is isolated to just your account. And it doesn't get automatically shared with like someone else's AWS account. In other words, when you create an Elastic Beanstalk instance, only your account is going to have access to that instance and not like Bill, Joe, or Ted down the street. They're not going to magically see this Elastic Beanstalk instance appear in their account. Now, this VPC right here is also used to implement a lot of different security rules and a lot of different ways of connecting together these different instances or these different services that you create on AWS. Now, before we move on, just one thing to make really clear here, in each of the different regions or data centers around the world, you automatically get one default VPC created. And so when we created our Elastic Beanstalk instance, it was automatically assigned to that default VPC, unless you are a total Elastic, or excuse me, a total AWS whiz, and you already decided to assign it to some other VPC for whatever reason. 
you get one of these default VPCs for every region around the world. Let's very quickly flip over to the AWS console and we'll take a look at the virtual VPC that was created for us. All right, so on services, I'll do a search for VPC and that will bring up the VPC dashboard. And then once over here, you can click on your VPCs on the left-hand side and it will show the default VPC. If you see multiple VPCs right here, it's probably because at some other point in time, you went through the process of creating another VPC. I only have one right here, and this is my default VPC. I can tell by scrolling over to the right-hand side, and you'll see this default VPC column says yes for me. Now, if I look at my ID right here, you'll notice it's like 0330 whatever. If I now flip over to some other region around the world, like let's say Paris, for example, I can flip over here. And after a very long load time, because this is on the other side of the world for me. So here are all the VPCs that I have in the Paris region. You'll notice that the ID of this VPC is distinctly different. So I copy the ID of the other one. In Northern California, I had 0330. Over here, I have 043F. So in other words, in every region, you get a different default VPC. All right. So with that knowledge in mind, we now are going to kind of take that idea of a VPC and figure out how we can get our different services to connect to each other. So to get these different services to connect to each other, we have to create something called a security group. A security group is a really fancy term for firewall rule. It's a rule describing what different services or what different sources of internet traffic can connect to different services running inside of your VPC. When you created the Elastic Beanstalk instance just a couple of seconds ago, or a couple of sections ago, excuse me, a security group was automatically created that allows any incoming traffic from anywhere in the world to connect to port 80 on your Elastic Beanstalk instance. Each of the different security groups that you create are going to apply to some set number of different services that exist inside of your VPC. So the security group that was created for Elastic Beanstalk is already kind of attached or kind of scoped to your Elastic Beanstalk instance. And that's what allows someone else in the world to come into your virtual private cloud and connect specifically to your Elastic Beanstalk instance. Now to look up this security group, we'll go back over to the VPC dashboard. Make sure that you're in the same region as where you just created the Elastic Beanstalk instance at. And then on the left-hand column, you can scroll down to security groups right here. And you'll see that there is a security group with the name of multi-docker-env. So again, this was a security group that was created for our Elastic Beanstalk environment. If you click on this thing, you can then see a little summary down at the bottom. And most interestingly, you can click on inbound rules. So these are the kind of security rules or firewall rules that are going to be applied to your Elastic Beanstalk instance. And so this inbound rule says that we're going to allow all HTTP traffic to come in on port 80 and that traffic can come from absolutely any source in the world. Security groups can also optionally have outbound rules as well. The current default outbound rule essentially says, yeah, we're just going to allow all traffic whatsoever, any traffic you can possibly imagine from that Elastic Beanstalk instance to reach any possible destination across the globe. All right. Now on this diagram right here, I also reflected like an additional security group. This was just a random one. I just mean to say you can create your own security groups that customize the way in which your different instances are allowed to receive or respond to traffic. So now that we understand what a VPC is, and now that we understand what a security group is, how are we going to form a connection between Elastic Beanstalk and RDS and EC? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new security group and the security group is going to say essentially as a rule, let any traffic access this instance if it belongs to this security group. So we're going to create the security group and then we're going to attach it to all three of these different services. So they're all going to belong to this one common security group. And the security group essentially says, if another AWS instance belongs to this thing right here, then let the traffic flow through and let them these different services talk to each other. So that's how we're going to get Elastic Beanstalk to talk to RDS and to EC as well. Again, the big takeaway here 
is that by default, when you create these services, they don't get to talk to each other. So we have to create the security group that specifically says, yeah, these different things can communicate with each other. All right, so that's pretty much it. I just wanted to give you a quick overview on the entire process before we go off and create the RDS and EC instances, because once you create them, it then gets a little bit confusing about, hey, what are we, you know, what are we doing here? Why are we clicking around all over the place? So let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna to start to create the RDS instance and the EC instance, and then create a new security group and apply that security group to all three of these different services inside of our VPC. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we had a very long discussion about the existence of VPCs and how security groups are used with them. So we're now going to start to create our RDS service that's going to be essentially a managed version of Postgres. And then if we have enough time, we'll do our Redis instance inside of Elastic Cache as well. So to get started, I'll flip back over to my AWS dashboard. I'm gonna make sure that I'm still inside the same region as my Elastic Beanstalk instance that I already created. And then on the services drop down at the top, I'll do a search for RDS. Again, that stands for Relational Database Service. All right, so once over here, you'll see like a ton of different pop-ups, a whole bunch of different stuff going on. If you see this kind of notification or anything like that, you can just close it at the top. And then we'll scroll down a little bit and find a section marked as Create Database, which is of course what we definitely want to do. So I'm going to click on Create Database. We then have to select the type of database that we want to create. So we can make a MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. You could do Amazon Aura, which is a fork, I believe, of MySQL specifically customized for AWS. But of course, for you and me, we want to make a Postgres instance. So I'll select Postgres over here. And then you get your little marketing spiel down here. I do recommend that you check this box down here to enable only options for free tier usage. Now, again, if your AWS account is over one year old, you do not qualify for free usage tier. You will see this option right here, even if you do not qualify for free usage. So my AWS account is many, many, many years old. I do not qualify for the free usage tier, but I still see the checkbox right here. I'll click next on the bottom right. And then we get asked to enter in a couple of details. So if you wanted to change the default version used, you could do it right here, but the default version is totally appropriate for us. You can then go a little bit lower and find DB instance class. Because we checked the only enable options eligible for free usage tier, the only class that we get is this T2 micro, which is essentially a very, very, very tiny virtual machine. Not a lot of power behind it. Maybe not the best instance to use if you expect a lot of traffic to come today to your database. We'll then scroll down a little bit more. You can see allocated storage right here. We definitely do not need 20 gigabytes for our application, but it is the minimum, so we'll leave it as that. We can then specify a couple of different settings in here. So stuff like DB instance identifier, blah, 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 all this other stuff. The only thing that we really care about is the master username and the master password. The username and the password right here maps up against, you might recall inside of our Docker Compose file at our API right here, you'll recall we had the Postgres username the database and password. So those entries that we're gonna enter in over there map up to these environment variables that we're going to eventually have to get into the API container at some point in time. So these are very meaningful pieces of information over here. Let's fill in the instance identifier first. I'll call this about just multi-docker RDS or how about multi-docker Postgres. We'll do a username here. You can do any username and any password you want. Just keep in mind, you have to remember these because we need to pass them off to the API service when it gets created on Elastic Beanstalk and at some point in the future. So I'm going to use a username of Postgres and I'm going to use a master password of Postgres password. Postgres password. And then I'm gonna flip on over and just create a new temporary document over here just to remind myself about those values. So my username is Postgres and my password is Postgres password. Again, you're going to need these pieces of information in just a little bit. So then we'll click on next. Now you might get some other options on here. We want to put this new database inside of our default VPC because we want it to talk to every other service out there. 
Ideally, we would assign a subnet group, but that's just a little bit outside of the scope of what we're doing in this course, so we'll leave it on default. And for public accessibility, we're going to be very, very 100% sure that no is selected because we do not want this thing to be publicly accessible by any other service beyond the ones that we assigned to our security group, which we discussed just a little bit ago. And then finally down here, you'll see VPC security groups. Now we are going to eventually make our own custom VPC security group and allocate everything to it, but you can just select create new VPC security group for now, but we're going to essentially overwrite that thing or at least change its rules. Now just a little bit more settings on here, we have to specify a database name. This is the same database name that we had to specify over inside of our Docker Compose file that I was just talking about a moment ago. So this is the PG database right here. So for my database name, I'll do something like, I don't know, fib values. I think that's reasonable. And I'm going to make sure that I record that is fib values, because again, we're going to need all this information in just a little bit. I'm going to make sure that I leave the default port on here. No reason to change it. And then we don't have to do anything with encryption. If you want to set up backups, this is where you would do it. Remember I had said that with these managed solutions, they will automatically make backups for you so that you can easily re roll back information if anything really goes wrong in your application. The default is seven days. You can go all the way down to like, oh, not zero days, one day, I suppose. You can actually do even more fine grained details than that, I believe, if you are willing to pay some money. We'll leave it as the default of seven days. And that's pretty much all we have to do here. So I'll click on create database at the very bottom. And then it's going to say, hey, it's going to take a couple of minutes to do this, which is totally fine. I can then click on all database instances and we'll see the new database we just created right here. And it has a status of creating. Okay, so that's it for RDS. We're going to let this thing do its bit. Let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and do our elastic cache setup for Redis as well. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our RDS instance, and we're just going to let it do its thing as it creates that database. While that's working, we're going to flip on over to another dashboard and create our Elastic Cache instance as well. So I'll click on Services up at the top, and I'll search for Elastic Cache. And OK, I've been saying Elastic Cache. I guess it's really Elastic Cache, whatever, all the same. OK, so once over here, we're going to scroll down a little bit. And we really want to launch a cluster, but it's showing me this kind of annoying dashboard right here. Let's try clicking on Redis on the left-hand side, and then we'll find the Create button up here. So then this is going to walk us through the process of creating a cluster. Now, the interesting thing here is that we are specifically making a cluster. So technically, when you make an Elastic Cache instance, we are getting a copy of Redis, but there's some kind of separate nodes that just relay information from the primary Redis node. Way more detail than we really need to go in. Just so you know, essentially, we're getting a very high-powered copy of Redis that would do really, really well if we had a lot of traffic. Now, by default, we don't really get the cluster created unless you select that little option right there. We do not need a cluster, so we're just going to leave it set as Redis without that checkbox checked. So then we'll throw a couple of options in here. For the name, I will enter in multi docker redis. We don't need a description. We can leave just about everything else on here at the default, except for the node type. So the default node type is a very expensive little instance. You would pay a lot of money for this thing. So we want to 120% make sure that you do not use the default selection here. So we'll click on little drop down, and then we're going to go to T2 and we want to do cache T2 micro, which is the cheapest copy around. It's also the lowest performance, but of course our application doesn't really have very high performance demands. And we'll click on save. Now I want you to really verify right here that we do in fact have the cheapest option selected, which should be a cache T2 micro. If you have anything else selected, you will pay some dollars for it. We then get asked for the number of replicas. On, in this case, replicas would be kind of those separate nodes that kind of supercharge your copy of Redis, again, kind of outside the scope. We don't need any replicas because we definitely do not have high performance demands for our application. So I'm going to change replicas to none. All right. So now we get asked a couple of other settings over here. Some of these are just a little bit nasty. We get asked to create a subnet. 
for this, we'll create a new subnet. This has to do a little bit with security. We don't really need to focus on the details of this thing too much. All we need to do is put in some name right here. I'll say Redis group. The one thing we do care about is marking the VPC ID as the default VPC. And so if you have a fresh AWS account, or if you've never created any other VPCs, the only option right here will be the default VPC that is created for your region. And so you will want to select that default VPC so that it's in the same kind of networking group as the RDS instance we put together already and the Elastic Beanstalk instance that we put together as well. And then for the subnets, we can just check both these right here. And it's just gonna give us access to those different subnets. All right, and that's pretty much it. You'll notice that we also have the option to select a security group right here, but we're gonna take care of the security group in just a little bit as a little follow-up to all this stuff. So I'll scroll on down to the bottom and I'll click on create. And that's pretty much it. It's now creating our instance of a Redis group of, I don't know, cache instances, whatever you wanna call it. All right, so we gotta wait for this thing to be created as well. So we'll take a quick pause and when we come back to the next section, we're gonna do the last step, which is to wire all this stuff up with a common security group and apply that security group to the Elastic Beanstalk, RDS and EC instances. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we set up our Elastic Cache Redis instance. You should eventually see this thing flip over with a status of green available. If you don't see it ever flip over, you can click the refresh button on the top right hand side. It should take some handful of minutes, somewhere up to, I don't know, four or five minutes or so. Now, just in case you skipped through the last section, one thing I want you to triple check right now, make sure that you have a node type of something like cache T2 micro. If you see something like M2 medium or M2 large or M4 or something like that, you might end up paying a decent amount of money for this Redis instance. So please make sure that you did correctly update the node type and you can see the value of it right there. So now that we've created both our Redis instance and our Postgres instance, we're going to now create a security group that is going to allow all three of these different services to talk to each other. So to create the security group, we're going to go back over to the VPC dashboard. To get there, I'll go to services on the top left hand side. I'll search for VPC and click on the VPC option. Then on the left hand side, we're going to scroll down just a little bit, find the security section and go to security groups. Now in this list, you're going to see that we now have a new security group listed that we did not have before. It is the RDS launch wizard. This is a security group that was automatically created when we were making the Postgres instance. We don't have to do anything with this. We're going to actually create a new security group to allow communication between our three services. So to create a new security group, I'll click on create security group at the top. And then we get prompted for a little bit of information. For the name, we'll do multi-docker. And for the description, I'll say something like traffic, for services in multi, oops, multi dash Docker app. And then I'll make sure that I have my default VPC selected on this dropdown. If you only have the default VPC created in your account, like I do, you're going to see only the one option right here. If you have created other VPCs for any reason, you'll want to make sure that you select the default VPC, unless you know what you're doing and you're trying to create all this stuff in a separate VPC. So then finally I'll click on yes, create. Now we're gonna wait just a minute or two for this thing to be created, and then we'll see it appear on the list right here. And so it's the one with the name tag of multi-docker. So we just created the security group. Now we need to create a rule inside of it that's going to specifically allow traffic between any service that is assigned to that security group. So to create that rule, I'm gonna select on the security group, and then I'll go to the inbound rules tab and I'll go to edit to add a new inbound rule. Now we're going to leave the type as custom TCP, we'll leave the protocol as TCP, we'll leave the port range as zero to just open up all ports. Actually, want, let's, let's restrict this just a little bit. There's no reason to open up everything. We'll allow just the ports between the default Redis port and the default Postgres port. So it's gonna be everything from 5432 to 6379. So I'll do 5432 to 6379. And notice how I'm separating the two with a little dash. Then for the source, this is the important part. We're going to allow traffic from any other instance 
that is in the same security group. So I'll click on source right here, and then I will select the SG multi-docker. That is the security group that we just created. That's the one that we are editing right now. So I'll select that, and that's going to allow traffic between all the different services that are assigned to this thing. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'll click on save right here. Save is successful. And now that's pretty much it for the security rule. Now, all we've done at this point was create the security group. We now have to go back through our three different services and assign the security group to each one. So we have to go look up Elastic Beanstalk instance. We have to apply the security group. We have to do the same thing for RDS and EC as well. So let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we created our new multi-docker security group that's going to allow traffic from any other instance that has the same security group applied to it. Now that's not the end of the story. We still have to go back over to each of these instances or each of these services and apply the security group to them so that they actually belong to the security group. So we'll start off first with Elastic Cache and then RDS and then update Elastic Beanstalk as well. So first one first, let's open up the services tab up here. And on the left hand history tab, you should see Elastic Cache. If you don't see it there for any reason, you can always do a search for cache and find Elastic Cache up here. Once over here on the dashboard, we'll select Redis on the left hand side. I'll then select this little checkbox right here and then click on Modify at the top. This will open up a little window that's going to allow us to make changes to this cluster. We're going to change the VPC security groups. So I'll click on the little pencil and then we'll put a checkbox next to the multi docker security group. And then finally save. Now, normally when we make a change to a Elastic Cache cluster, it's going to try to schedule that maintenance for some very specific time, usually some overnight period where hopefully not a lot of people are using our service. But making changes to a security group doesn't actually require a maintenance window, even though this thing is going to tell you that it does. So we can just click on modify and it will immediately start to change the security groups on there. That's pretty much it. So we'll now move on to our next service, RDS. So I'll again go up to the Services tab. I'll do a search for RDS and find Manage RDS. We can find the Instances section on the left-hand panel, and then select the one database instance that we have, the Multi-Docker Postgres. Now finding the security groups on here, it's a little bit more varied. So we're going to scroll on down past all the different charts that we have on here. So scroll, scroll, scroll. Here's the details section. Under details, you'll see all the different security groups that are currently being applied to this instance. We can't change it from right here. We have to go back up to this details heading and then look all the way over to the right hand side and you'll see the modify button. So we'll click on modify and then we go back into this kind of wizard screen. We'll scroll on down to network and security and you'll see the security group section inside of here. You can select this drop down and then find multi-docker right here. So there's multi-docker being applied as a security group. And then we'll scroll on down to the very bottom. And at the very bottom, you'll see the button that says continue. So we'll click that. And now again, it's going to tell you that it wants to schedule maintenance and it wants to make this change at some point in the future. That is not true of a security group change. You don't have to schedule any maintenance, but if you feel like it, you can just hit apply immediately. Again, it's not going to actually restart the database or anything like that. So either one, just go ahead and click Modify DB Instance. And then if you click on Instances, again, back on the left-hand side, you may or may not see this thing flip over to something that says like updating. If I refresh here, okay, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But if you click on the database again, and then scroll back down to that Details section, you will see Security Groups adding the multi-docker security group right there. All right, so that's it for RDS. So the last one we have to take care of is Elastic Beanstalk. So I'm going to again go up to Services. I'll find Elastic Beanstalk on History. Now, as you can see, my environment is a little broken right now, which is totally fine. I made a little change to it. It's not actually broken. It just thinks that it's very temporarily broken. So just ignore the fact that I have a, a severe environment for right now. No issue there. On the left-hand side, we'll find the section that says Configuration. And then in the very sec very middle here, I'll see the card that says instances. We'll click on modify on the bottom. 
and then we'll scroll on down to the very bottom here and we'll see EC2 security groups. So as you might guess, we're going to add a checkbox next to multi Docker and then I'll click on apply. We're going to get a quick warning right here. This is just saying that it's going to create all of our or restart our EC2 instances, which is no issue whatsoever because we're not doing anything with our Elastic Beanstalk instance just yet. So on the bottom right hand side, I'll click on confirm. Okay, so that's going to update our environment, which will take just a couple minutes. So let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and start working on a little last piece of setup of our environment on Elastic Beanstalk. So quick break and I'll see you in just a moment. In the last section, we wired up a security group to all three of our different important resources, the Elastic Beanstalk instance, RDS, and EC. Now the very last piece of configuration we have to do now is make sure that our different containers inside of the Elastic Beanstalk instance know how to reach out to RDS and EC. And so to do so, we have to set a couple of environment variables just as we did previously inside of our Docker Compose file. So remember inside of Docker Compose on our API or the Express server, we set up this list of different environment variables. And we did the same thing for our worker process as well. Here it is right here. We set up the Redis host and the Redis port. So in order for both our Express API and the Redis server, or excuse me, the worker to work correctly, we have to provide these different environment variables. So that's what we're going to do by using the console over on Elastic Beanstalk. So I'm going to make sure that I'm still looking at my Elastic Beanstalk instance. I'm going to find configuration on the left hand side. And then I'll select modify on the software card. I went there really quickly. Sorry about that. On the software card, I'll select modify. And then down at the very bottom, I'll see the different environment properties that I can set up. Now, I'll be honest with you, these environment properties do not get their values hidden over here. And so once you enter these properties in, potentially other people could come to this page and see your database password. I've looked at the Elastic Beanstalk documentation and supposedly this is nonetheless where we're supposed to put these passwords. I don't know if there's a better place out there. If there is, I encourage you to add a note on this lecture and say, hey, here would be a better way of doing this. This is one of my kind of weak points in this regard. So let's get to it. We're going to add on a collection of different environment variables here. We're going to go just straight down this list with all the different variables. So the first one we'll add in is the Redis host. So the name will be Redis host. And then the value is not going to be simply just like, you know, Redis or anything like that. It's going to be the actual endpoint or URL of our running Elastic Cache instance. So to get that, we need to actually flip on over to the Elastic Cache dashboard one more time. So I'm going to scroll up, I'll go to services, and then I'm going to open up Elastic Cache in a new tab. And then I'll close the services dropdown and go back down to environment properties. Now in the second tab that I just opened up, I can look at Redis. I can click on the little arrow right here to expand it. And you're going to see a primary endpoint listed right here. So we're going to copy that primary endpoint. Now note on the primary endpoint, there's the colon 6379 to designate the port. We don't want to copy that. So I'm going to make sure that I copy everything to the left of that colon. So I'm going to copy that. I'll go back over to my environment properties. And for Redis host, I'm going to paste in a value of that endpoint. Now take note on the very right hand side over here, I do not have a colon. I do not have the 6379. So please make sure that you trim that off as well. So next up, we'll do our Redis port. So I'll again, copy the name of the variable over. And as you might guess, we're using the default port of 6379. So I'll set a value of 6379 like so. All right, that's it for Redis. So now we're going to move on to PG user, all the other Postgres variables as well. So for PG user, I'll copy that over. And this is where I hope you still have that document where we saved some of the different usernames and whatnot. So this is the different variables that we entered when we created our RDS instance or the Postgres instance. So my username that I used was simply Postgres. So I will copy Postgres over for the PG user entry. Next up, we need our PG. Let's skip on down to the password because those should really be right in a row. So my PG password was Postgres password. 
And that's what I wrote down in my document over here. Next step, we need our PG host. So I'll put in PG host. We again need to open up the RDS dashboard, just like we did with ElastiCache, and get the endpoint for our Postgres instance. So I'll flip back over to that second tab. I'll again go up to services. I'll go back to the RDS dashboard. I'll click on the instances section. I'll open up the database instance. And then finally down towards the bottom in that details section, Oh, not details, but connect right here. I'll find the endpoint listed. So I'm going to copy that entire endpoint. And then I'll paste it back over on my environment properties for the PG host, like so. Okay, so we've got PG user, password, and host. I think we just got a couple more here. Let's see, we got PG database. So that's our next key, PG database. For that, my database name was fib values. That's why I called my database. And then finally, we got our PG port. That's the very last one, PG port. And as you can see over on the dashboard, we did not change the default port of 5432. Okay. Now, quick pause right here. I got to tell you, in all the courses I've ever done, the most common error that I ever see in my life this is repeated over and over and over again. The most common error by far is people entering in these environment properties with incorrect spellings for the names or incorrect values. So at this point, I gotta ask you, please, I beg you, triple check the names of all the environment properties listed over here. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if your application worked successfully in our development environment when we were using Docker Compose, but does not work properly, when you push it up to Elastic Beanstalk or you push it up to production, one of the first things that I will tell you to troubleshoot is to come look at these variable names and all the different values in triple check to make sure that they are correct. So I ask you again, please triple check the names, triple check your values, make sure you've got the correct things in here. Now, once you've got everything entered in successfully, we'll add, hit the apply button on the bottom right hand side. Okay, so that's going to make a couple changes and apply them to our environment. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's all we got to do for setup. Now, one little piece of trivia here, something you might be curious about. Back when we put together the Docker Compose file, we had to manually specify all these environment variables and specifically pass them into this specific service. And we did the same thing for Redis on the worker down here as well. Now, on Elastic Beanstalk, when you set up those environment variables, they automatically get added to all of the different containers that you listed inside of that Docker run AWS.json file. So every single one of these containers has automatic access to that set of environment variables. So we do not have to do any additional environment variable mapping. So that makes life a little bit easier. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's all we had to do for the AWS setup. So now the very last thing we have to do is a couple more changes to the Travis.yaml file to make sure that after we successfully build all these images and push them off to Docker Hub, we are going to do that little tap on the shoulder of Elastic Beanstalk and tell it to repull all the images and attempt to deploy them. So let's do another quick break, come back to the next section and start to wrap up the Travis.yaml file. In the last section, we finished up just about everything on the AWS dashboard. There's one last little thing we have to do, and it's tied to the deployment that we're going to set up inside of our Travis.yaml file. So remember, at this point inside of the Travis.yaml file, we're currently building the production version of all of our images, and then we push them off to Docker Hub. Now, I have said several times that after we do all that stuff, we're going to then kind of tap on the shoulder here we go. I'm going to kind of tap on the shoulder of Elastic Beanstalk and say, hey, it's time for you to go and pull these new images and deploy them. And so I'm going to be honest with you. When I said kind of tap on the shoulder, I made it sound like it was a different deployment process than what we had done on the previous application. In reality, it's going to be no different. We're going to still deploy the entire application over to Elastic Beanstalk. The only difference this time around is that the only file that we really have to deploy is the or send over to Elastic Beanstalk is the docker run.aws.json file. We're going to send the entire project over to Elastic Beanstalk, but in reality, this is the only file that we really have to send. Once Elastic Beanstalk gets this file, it's going to pull these images from Docker Hub and take it away from there. 
But again, I've been saying like, oh yeah, we're gonna send a little notification. There's not really a notification. We're just gonna dump the entire project over the same way we did previously. Now I've got the Travis file from our previous project. Remember, this is the single container application that we just put together. And here's what we did for the deploy section. So we had to set up the provider as Elastic Beanstalk, specify the region, app, environment, blah, 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 all this different stuff. And one of the real keys in here was providing the access key ID and the secret access key as well. And these were both set as environment variables on our Travis CI dashboard. So in this section, we're gonna generate a new AWS access key and secret key on the IAM dashboard on AWS. And then we will assign those in as environment variables to our Travis build. So let's get to it. So to get started, I'm gonna open my AWS dashboard back up. I'll go to services and we will again go to IAM. And then on the left-hand side, I'll find the user section because we're going to create a new user with deploy access to Elastic Beanstalk. So I can click on that add user button and then I will use a username of something like multi-docker. How about multi-docker deployer? That makes sense. And then we'll give it an access type of programmatic access and then permissions. Again, we're going to attach existing policies directly. I'll do a search for Elastic. Actually, we'll do just Beanstalk is probably the easier one to search for. And then we're just gonna add everything straight down here. Just toss it all on. We could definitely go a little bit more fine grained, but for right now, I just want something that's going to work as it stands. I'll then do next review. And then we'll do a create user. Now this is gonna show us the user, the access key ID, and the secret access key. Remember, the secret access key right here is something that you do not want to share with the outside world whatsoever. And of course, you can try to use my secret access key, but by the time you watch this video, I will have deleted it because we've gotta be responsible with those secret access keys. So now that we've got the keys right here, we'll open up Travis CI again and set these up as encrypted variables on the dashboard. So I've still got my Travis dashboard open. As a quick reminder, you can get here by going to travis-ci.org. Once over here, you're gonna make sure that you open up the multi Docker project. So make sure that you are not looking at Docker React. This is bad. We're gonna look at multi Docker. We'll then go over to options, settings, and then we're going to add in some new environment variables. And of course we can still see the Docker ID and password that we had previously set up. So the first variable we will set up is the AWS access key. And then I'll copy over the access key and paste it in as the value. Now, like I just said a moment ago, please triple check the spelling on the key right here. So AWS access key, make sure it's got the two C's and two S's in it. And then I'll add that thing. And then we'll do the same thing for AWS secret key. And I'll copy the secret key over here and paste it in as the value. And again, please triple check, make sure you spelled secret correctly, especially the word secret. This is a very easy word, believe it or not, to misspell. We'll click on add, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so we've set up our environment variables over here. So now the last thing we need to do is add on our little deploy script at the very bottom of the travis.yaml file. So let's take care of that in the next section. So quick break and I'll see you in just a moment. All right, we just about got everything set up. The very last thing we have to do is add on the deploy section to our travis.yaml file. So let's get to it. Now the deploy section that we're gonna add on here is going to be just about identical to the one that we did on our previous project, the single container deployment. So a lot of these options are gonna be very similar. And so we're gonna go through them rather quickly. So at the bottom of travis.yaml, I'll add on the deploy section. I'll add a provider of Elastic Beanstalk. A uh, quick reminder here, we do not put any dashes in here because these are not array entries. It's all one single configuration object. Next up, we'll add on the region. For the region, I'm gonna flip back over to my dashboard for Elastic Beanstalk, which I still have open. And remember, you can get your region very easily by looking at the subdomain on your URL. So that subdomain right there, that's the region that we're talking about. So I'm gonna copy that and put it over as my region entry. 
for my app entry. My app name is multi-docker. That's the first part of the kind of header up here. The env is going to be, or environment will be the multi-docker-env right here. And so I'll put that in as the environment. Next up, we have to do our bucket name and the bucket path. And this is going to be where Travis zips up our entire project and where it stashes it inside of some S3 bucket. So remember, we are probably going to want to go over to S3 really quickly and make sure that there's some bucket over there that we can use. So I'm going to flip back over to my dashboard. I'll go to services and then S3. And then on here, I'm gonna find my bucket for the region that I'm currently in. So for me, it's Elastic Beanstalk US West 1 right here. I'll click on that and then I'm gonna get the bucket name if I can copy it. I don't think I can copy it up at the top. I feel like I copied it. Yeah, there we go. That's better. So I'm gonna copy the bucket name and I'll put it in here as the bucket name. And then we have to do a bucket path as well. And for this one, I'll again, just call it but Docker multi. Now, previously we had said only try to deploy this thing on branch master. We're going to do the same thing this time around. So only try to run this deployment when the branch that we are pushing or building up on Travis is the master branch. In other words, if we push up some like feature branch, don't try to build and deploy this thing. And then finally, we're going to do our access key ID as AWS access key. Again, remember there are two C's in the word access. And we'll do secret access key. And we'll say this is going to be a secret, or excuse me, not secret, but secure. AWS secret key, like so. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's all we have to do for our Travis.yaml file. So now the last thing we have to do is actually deploy this thing and test it out. So I'm gonna make sure I save this file. We'll take a quick break right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we pushed up all of our code to GitHub. Travis pulled it down and started to build the project. Now I've got my build right here and it looks like it was successfully built and deployed off to Elastic Beanstalk. So if you have any error at the Travis CI step, it, it very likely means that you might've made a typo somewhere along the way. As a reminder, you can always check out the GitHub repository of all of my code, which is linked in one of the very first sections in this entire course. And so that's a great place to get started if you wanna do a little bit of troubleshooting. Now, assuming that the deploy for you went successfully, so all the way down here, I can see deploying application, no problems with that. We can then flip over to our Elastic Beanstalk dashboard over on AWS. So once you go over here, you might see an error or a warning, which again, is totally fine. We very much expected this to happen. I just wanted you to see an example error with a deployment like this. So if I scroll down a little bit, I can see recent events and underneath recent events, you might notice an error message right here. And it says invalid setting for container client. So that is a invalid setting that was detected inside of our docker run.aws.json file right here. In particular, it's complaining to say that we did not specify an option called memory, and we must specify this option if we're going to use the Docker run file. So what's going on here? Well, essentially, we correctly put together our Docker run file, but we missed one required option for every one of our container definitions, and that is a memory option. Essentially, when Elastic Beanstalk decides to create each of these containers, it's going to allocate some amount of RAM to each of them. And it, so it wants us to tell it exactly how much RAM or how much memory should be allocated to each container. And we do so by adding in a memory option to each of these different objects inside of here. So underneath the essential flag on client, I'm gonna put a comma and I'll specify memory. And then we're going to specify the amount of memory in megabytes. Now for this step, Unfortunately, it's kind of challenging for me to give you very strong guidance on exactly how much memory should be allocated to each of these services, or more precisely, how much memory you should use as a rule of thumb. The best guidance I can possibly give you is to do a little bit of research to look up these services that you're trying to host. And there's traditionally, there tends to be many Stack Overflow posts that give a little bit of guidance on the appropriate amount of memory to allocate. So for our application, we're just going to do a straight across the board, 128 megabytes for every one of our services. 
again, I'm not going to necessarily say this is good practice or bad practice, or maybe we're putting too much memory into one service or too little into another. I really recommend that when you start working on your own projects, you do a little bit of research on this front. So I'm going to take this memory 128, I'm going to copy it, and then I'll go down to the server. At the end of essential, I'll put a comma, and I'll paste in memory 128. I'll go to worker, I'll find essential false, I'll put a comma in and do memory 128. And then finally, I'll do the same thing down on Nginx. Here's links, I'll put a comma at the very end, and I'll do memory 128 again. Okay, so that's it, I'm gonna save this file, and then we will again flip back over to our terminal. We'll do a get status. So we made a change, and we now want to deploy this change. So we'll do a git add, a commit, I'll say something like added memory allocation, and I'll do a git push origin master again. And now just like before, this is going to send all of our code to GitHub. Travis CI is gonna pull it down, build our images, push them off to Docker Hub, and then attempt to send that Docker run JSON file back over to Elastic Beanstalk. So another quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. Once again, if anything goes wrong, totally fine. This is all a part of the debugging process. So if anything goes wrong, continue in the next section and we'll take a look at any possible error message. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we made a little change to our Docker run file and redeployed the application. I've now sat through the redeployment and it looks like everything went through successfully and the application should now be working. Now, if you do not see health of OK right here, or if you see any other errors appearing in the log down there, one quick tip that I'll give you for debugging here, and this is where I recommend you first go to to figure out exactly what went wrong, you can click over on the logs tab on the left-hand side. And then on the far right-hand side, click on request logs, and then last 100 lines. This will give you the last 100 lines of output from each of your containers, along with a couple other services that are used to host your application. So you can then look at the log file by clicking on that download link and you'll get a very large, rather consolidated log file. So this has logs from a bunch of different services and they're all placed in these different sections. So this is one section of logs and it contains all the logs from a ECS-init log file. Remember that when we use Elastic Beanstalk with a multi-container setup, behind the scenes it's actually using that ECS or Elastic Container Service application that we had mentioned a little bit ago. You'll also see some PHP app logs inside of here. Those are logs that are generated by the default Elastic Beanstalk application that was created when we first made our environment. And then if you go through here, you'll eventually start to see some logs from say, uh, here we go. So our container logs from the client container. Here's from the Nginx container. Here's from a Nginx proxy, which is being used to route information around our application. And here's the server logs right here as well. So again, if you have an error being displayed on the dashboard back on Elastic Beanstalk, I encourage you to take a glance at these logs, read through them somewhat deeply. Somewhere inside of here will be a message telling you exactly what went wrong. All right, so with that in mind, if the deployment went successfully, you can go back over to Elastic Beanstalk and find the URL to the application up here at the very top. So you can click on that link and it will open up our application. And so my app is hosted at multi-docker slash, excuse me, multi-docker dash env, and then some string, blah, 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 elasticbeanstock.com. I can now enter in some index of a value to calculate and then click on submit. And if I refresh the page, I'll see that index up here. Cool, so that's pretty much it. We can refresh as much as we want. We can add in some value and it'll just calculate the Fibonacci value for any given number. So that's pretty much it. I hope you've enjoyed this application, at least the deployment part. The last thing I want to show you is in the next section, I just want to go through the process of redeploying the app and making sure that we can get some updates to appear on the screen. So one last section, and I'll see you in just a minute. The last thing that I want to do with our application is a very quick change to some of the source code inside of it. I then want to redeploy the application and just make sure that we can get changes to appear on the screen. So inside of my client directory, I'll find the source folder and then the app.js file. Inside of here, we've got the H1 title of Welcome to React. Let's just change that text in there to something like Bib Calculator. I'll then save the file. We'll then flip back over to our terminal. 
I'll do a git status and verify that the change is there. Yep, it is. We'll do a add, a commit, and then of course, of course, a push origin master. And that'll push those changes up to GitHub. Now, the entire flow of making changes on a branch and then merging a pull request and then only deploying those changes can absolutely still be used with this multi-container deployment. In other words, that entire kind of development workflow that we went over through with that single container deployment, totally applicable here as well. But I think that we've seen enough examples of that. So we're just kind of short circuiting the process more or less and doing a deployment directly to master where it will then be built and deployed off to Elastic Beanstalk. So let's take another quick pause. I'll let the deployment go through and then we'll catch up in the next section and just make sure that all those changes, or I guess that one change that we made, shows up on the title of our application. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a second. In the last section, we made a very small change to our application and then redeployed it again. As usual, went up to Travis CI that built our images, pushed them over to Docker Hub, and then pushed our entire project over to Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk then saw the updated docker run.aws.json file, pulled down the new images, and launched them as new containers for our application. So now if we revisit our link, we'll see Fib Calculator appear as the title at the very top. Cool, so that's pretty much it. Well, we've looked through at everything we need to know about single container deployments and multi-container deployments on Elastic Beanstalk. Now, before we move on, one quick reminder here, it's extremely important for you to close down all the resources that we used during this section, unless you very specifically want to keep them around. So one last quick break. In the next section, we're going to walk through the process together of shutting down all the resources that we just created. In this section, we're going to walk through the process of shutting down the three different resources that we created while we deployed our multi-Docker application. So as a quick reminder, we got a couple things to shut down here. Let's see, here we go. Good enough diagram right here. So we need to shut down the Elastic Beanstalk environment, the RDS instance, and the EC instance as well. We do not strictly have to shut down or close off the security group that we had created. There's no billing associated with creating a security group, but we'll walk through the process of deleting it anyways, just in case you don't want to have any stray security groups running around your application. So let's get to it. First thing we're going to clean up is our Elastic Beanstalk instance. So on services tab, I'll go back to Elastic Beanstalk. I'll then find the multi Docker environment or excuse me, application. And on the right hand side, I'll click on actions and then delete application and then click on the delete button. So that's going to start the process of deleting the application. It's going to appear that nothing is happening for a minute or two, but you can refresh the page a couple of times and eventually you're going to see that it says, okay, we're closing things down. And in fact, if you click into the application itself, you'll probably even see the events right here that say, okay, it's terminating the environment. All right, next up is RDS, so our Postgres database. I'll again go to services and then search for RDS. We can then go to DB instances, either right here in the middle or the instances button on the left-hand side. We can then click on, oop, don't wanna click on that. We'll click on the little check mark right there. And then we can go to instance actions and delete. So we'll delete this. We do not want to create a final snapshot because there's no data for us to really save here. So I'll click on no. We'll hit I acknowledge that we're not making any backups of this thing. And then I'll enter in delete me. And then finally I'll click on delete at the bottom right. And then we see that is deleting. And at the very last one, we'll look up Elastic Cache right here. I'll go to the Redis tab on the left-hand side. And then again, I'll click on the little, I don't know, checkbox right there. All these UIs look it's very subtly different. It's always kind of funny. Anyways, check on the, click on the checkbox and then hit the delete button at the top. And yes, we want to delete this cluster. Okay, that's good. And then finally, we're gonna clean up the security group that we had created on the VPC. So I'll look at VPC. And then on the left hand side, we'll scroll on down to security groups. I'll select multi-docker, multi-docker env, 
and the RDS launch wizard right here as well. Now with these security groups, this is the only location where you can very easily mess up other services that might be running on your account. So please triple check and make sure you're deleting multi-docker, multi-docker, and the RDS launch wizard. So I'm gonna make sure I select all three of those, and then I'll do security group actions at the top, and I'll delete those security groups. And again, please triple check to make sure you've got the correct ones selected here. And I'll click on yes, delete. Now, just in case you see this right here, you might see uh, one or two on here that say, hey, we can't actually do that. So if you see that around the first one, multi-docker env right there, or multi-docker the bottom one right here, that's totally okay. It means that these are tied to existing Elastic Beanstalk or other existing services that you already have. So you might have to wait a couple minutes and then come back to this page and try deleting them again, because we are in the process of deleting some other resources that are still using these groups. So for me, I'm just gonna hit okay, and I'll come back to this later on and attempt to delete these later. Now, as a quick reminder, if you don't delete these, it's totally fine. You don't get billed for this at all, no billing whatsoever. They can sit in your account for all time and nothing bad is going to happen. Now, the very last thing that you might want to clean up is on the IAM dashboard, we can clean up our deploy keys that we had generated. So on IAM, I'll find my users tab on the left-hand side, and then I'll delete the user that I'd created. So here's multi-docker deployer right here and I'll go ahead and delete that user. So eventually this thing's gonna, there we go, finally. So you'll notice that it says that these things are deleting this might affect running systems. That's totally okay for us. We definitely wanna delete this thing. So I'll check the box over there and then click on yes, delete. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That is the cleanup. So I hope that you enjoyed putting together this multi-container application, but there's still a lot for us to do and a lot to learn. So let's take a quick pause right here and continue and keep going in the next section.